Berkeley morning. I felt after I'd killed my neighbor's parrot that I should do something positive for the world. I'd seen a documentary where people who'd accidentally killed other people found solace in volunteering with animals. It seemed like a logical thing to do and made me feel lucky that it was only a parrot I'd killed and not a person. I tried to volunteer at an old people's home because I thought it might be fun to let them tell me their stories about the war, but apparently you don't walk into old people's homes and start volunteering. There were organizations to join, and background checks to be done, and schedules to be coordinated, and duties to be timetabled. The endeavor to give of myself got to be so overwhelming that I decided to forget the whole project and go shopping for some storage baskets instead. That's what took me to Hearst Street. It was an avenue that branched off campus and spliced the city. It was where the migrant workers from Mexico waited, staking out their stretches of pavement to be picked up by people who needed cheap labor. The men strung themselves along the sidewalk in work shirts, jeans, baseball hats. They stood alone rather than together. At a stop sign, the sun hit my windshield and blanketed the glass. The street vanished, and all I could see was a pane of iridescent watermarks. I stopped. I crept forward. I went faster, faster, and it felt like it was going to be all right until I hit something. The thump, unmistakable, of a body. I stopped. My knuckles blanched white on the steering wheel. I shrieked and gasped and cursed. I said and did everything you're supposed to do when you hit someone with your car, and I actually meant it this time, not like when I killed the parrot. The man sat on the road where he'd fallen kneading the heel of his hand into his thigh. He was tall and thin and had black hair that rose from his head like it was caught in a perpetual wind. He was younger than the other men, and there was no squint when he looked right at me and shook his head. Lady, was all he said. I took him home. I wanted to make sure he wasn't hurt, and also I wanted to get the hell out of there before someone called the police. It didn't occur to me that men who line up on Hearst don't call the police. He rode in the front seat and said nothing, and I wondered if he spoke English. When we got home, I poured him a glass of water. Ice? I asked. He said nothing. I brought home a stray cat before, but never a stray Mexican. I wasn't sure what to do with him now that he was in my kitchen, so I offered him more water. Should I work? He finally asked. I had him check my smoke alarms. What's your name? I asked. Diego. That was one of the top baby names of 2004, I said. <laughs> Diego said nothing. He tested the smoke alarms by rolling a baton of newspaper, lighting it on the stove, and holding it up to each alarm until it triggled, triggered a signal. Soon the flame burnt down to the paper's end and nipped his fingers. He flung it away and let it drift, smoldering to the kitchen floor. I had him change the water in my vase of lilies, and then I asked him to vacuum the stairs. I got the feeling this wasn't the sort of work he was used to. <laughs> I decided to make us both sandwiches, and while I was working, I caught him staring at my feet. Why are your feet like this, he asked. Like what? Your feet, he splayed his fingers. Your feet are like earthquakes. He knelt where I stood, and without asking, he picked up my foot, nearly toppling me to the floor. See, he said, earthquakes, and traced his nail along the dry cracks that radiated across my heel, where the skin grew as thick as a hoof. With his fingers, he traced my arch and the calluses to the side of my toe. Then he dropped my foot and started opening and closing cupboards. Open, close, open, close. At last, he found a mixing bowl and salt. A moment later, I was sitting at the breakfast table, and Diego was guiding my foot into a bucket of salty hot water. Stay, he said. And then he drew a knife from his pocket. This was not a Swiss army knife. I don't think Swiss people carry knives like this one. This was a blade that sang when it sprung from its sheath. He placed the blade on a callus and began steadily to saw away at it. I could hardly breathe. I, I have a pumice stone, I said. But Diego ignored me. His fingers were pale and long enough to encircle my foot. Why are you f your feet like this, he asked again and shook his head. Diego, here's what I wanted to tell you. I used to get pedicures. I used to go to nail salons where Vietnamese nail technicians would talk about my feet like they weren't in the room. 
They'd call each other over to get a good long gawk at my heels, as if they were rare medical anomalies, as if they, the women, were surgeons, inviting each other to view an elephantine prostate. I never found a pedicurist who didn't shame my feet, so I stopped going altogether. Diego toweled my feet off when he finished. I gave him three twenties and took him back to the street. The next morning, I went back and tried to find him. I'd had a horrible thought during the night that he may have been internally bleeding. I hadn't even asked to see the place where I'd hidden. It struck me that my attempt to atone for a dead parrot may have resulted in a dead person. Here's the whole truth about my neighbor's parrot. It wasn't a parrot I'd flattened, but a parakeet. I was backing out of my driveway one morning last week on my way to a big room yoga class when I heard a faraway crunch. It was a crunch like a crushed box of cornflakes, but a small box, the kind they put out for hotel breakfasts. It wasn't cornflakes, it was Jumpa, my neighbor's little blue friend, plastered now to the grooves of my tire. I collected Jumpa in a dish towel and placed her in a reusable Lululemon bag, which I thought was an especially nice gesture because Lululemon bags are extremely versatile and people even sell them on eBay. <laughs> My neighbor didn't notice the Lululemon bag. She shrieked and gasped and made all the sounds you're supposed to make when you find your parrot dead. I shrieked and gasped too, but I don't think she believed me. It was my hybrid's fault, with its quiet, fuel-efficient engine. Diego hadn't heard the haunted whisper of my Prius, and that's how I'd hit him.